You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another feast day quick take on the feast of St. John of Capistrano. But wait, put the brakes on, not San Juan Capistrano, the place. Today's saint did not come from California, if that thought crossed your mind. If you live in the States, you almost can't help but make the association, especially since we just teased you with a tune. But today's saint never stepped foot in North America, and he had nothing to do with the founding of the famous mission on the West Coast. But today's St. John does have a connection with the mission, famous now for its swallows, which do not really come back anymore. Um, Bing Crosby is going to be waiting a really long time if he is counting on those birds, but more on that later. Today's saint, John of Capistrano, was born in, you guessed it, Capistrano, Italy, in 1386 in a region known as Abruzzo, which is about one-third up the calf of the boot of Italy. He is the patron saint of military chaplains, and though he fought in only one battle, and that just before his death at the age of 70, he is known as the soldier saint. But he is also, understandably, the patron saint of jurists, or legal judges. A highly successful student at the University of Perugia, Italy, St. John studied both civil and church law, and already renowned for his learning and ability, was appointed the governor of Perugia at the age of just 26. A capable diplomat when war broke out between the region of Perugia and the prominent house of Maldesta, John was dispatched to make peace. But a surprise to everyone, and especially to John perhaps, he failed miserably, maybe the first time in his life, and was thrown in the dungeon by the Maldestas. Once the shock wore off, it must have been pretty dispiriting, especially as time went by, weeks and then months, with no ransom forthcoming, nothing but plenty of time to meditate upon his woes, his life and where it was going or where it was not going. It must have seemed like the end of the road for John, the worst thing that could happen to a young man. His failure had been so complete, no one even cared to redeem him from captivity. But it was not the end of St. John's Road. Rather, our saint had landed on one of the divine roundabouts that you become familiar with when you read the lives of the saints. And this roundabout had a brown-robed traffic cop directing him to his next exit. Here's the story. One day, as John lay chained to the stone wall of his prison, despairing of his release, and coming to terms with the possible necessity of preparing his soul to die before anyone at home remembered about him, from out of the shadows a bright light appeared, surrounding, he realized as his eyes adjusted, the figure of a Franciscan friar. The friar, whom we can surmise was the great St. Francis himself, though this is not specifically recorded, chided St. John on his reliance on such an unstable world and invited him to join his order. St. John's reply, I had never thought about embracing such a life. Still, if God so wills it, I will obey. And God soon gave him the opportunity to prove those words. Within a short time, his ransom, which was a very large amount, was mysteriously provided, and indeed, free to do as he wished, John immediately applied to the Franciscan Abbey in Perugia. But he was not immediately accepted. A man well known in the city he had governed as worldly and powerful, St. John's intentions were met with suspicion by all, in and outside of the order. After many trials testing his humility and the authenticity of his vocation, he finally received the habit of St. Francis in 1416. But it took years of mortification, perfect obedience, and genuine devotion before he finally won the trust of his fellow Franciscans. Gifted the opportunity to study under St. Bernardine of Siena, St. John grew rapidly in grace and learning, soaking up theology by what seemed like divine infusion. St. Bernardine wrote of him, John achieves more in his sleep than those who study night and day. After completing his vows, based on this learning and his natural gift of oratory, the Franciscans sent St. John out almost immediately into the field, which was an exceptionally needy world, 
fraught with heresy, license, and the threat of Muslim invasion. St. John's labors on earth were bound to perpetual battle, but for most of his life the war for souls was fought with words. Sent through many of the provinces of Italy in the first years, by his piety and zeal, he quickly gained crowds of listeners, so large he was forced to move his sermons from the church into town squares and empty meadows. Building with his reputation as a holy preacher, his crowds grew to the thousands. Once in Brescia, Italy, they counted over 125,000 people in the crowd. His heartfelt oratories, centering often on our Lord's sacred passion and on the Blessed Mother, so touched souls that conversions filled the confessionals and baptismal fonts of churches for miles around. But profound in humility, St. John would hear no praise for his efforts, always saying, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to thy name give glory. Through St. Bernardine and St. John Capistrano's devotion to the holy name of Jesus, and by the intercession of the Blessed Mother, many souls were saved, and the two saints, together with St. James of the March, revived and reformed the Franciscan order, which had fallen into laxity. In his seventy years of life, St. John's influence and ability was so trusted in the Church that Popes Martin V, Eugene IV, Nicholas V and Callistus III counted on him as papal nuncio to halt the progress of heresy, sending him as an ambassador of orthodoxy throughout northern and central Europe, canvassing the Holy Roman Empire, preaching throughout Germany, Bohemia, Moravia, Austria, Croatia, and Poland. In his travels, he is recorded as performing multitudes of miracles, such as curing the sick, raising the dead, and crossing rivers, like St. Raymond of Penafort, using his cloak as a boat. By 1454, the troubles in Europe became eclipsed by a general threat to Christianity by the Muslim hordes, and St. John was employed in this endeavor as well. Pope Callistus III, having proclaimed a crusade to combat the threat, appointed St. John to preach the crusade among the German Catholics in an effort to raise an army. And raise an army he did, but not in Germany. He amassed forty to fifty thousand troops, chiefly from among the Hungarian peasants and minor landowners, who were untrained and poorly armed, but filled with holy zeal. Led by St. John, a self-appointed spiritual adjunct to Hungarian general of the force, John Hunyadi, the force for Christianity approached Belgrade, Serbia, then under siege by the Muslims. With the standard of the holy name in his hands and on his heart, St. John, seventy years old and feeble, he is described as looking like no more than skin and bones at the time, led the charge to save Christendom. Outnumbered, it is estimated by ten to one, but with the name of Jesus their rally cry, the warriors of Christ emerge vic miraculously victorious, and Christian Europe was saved. For the time being. We know where we are now on the heresy and hordes front, and it's not good. Wouldn't you love to see St. John on fire for love of God, banner held aloft, charging headlong against the scourges that have rotted Christendom in our own day? And can't you hear St. John saying he'd love to see each of us charging into battle against evil under the banner of the holy name? Never say it can't be done. If a 70-year-old could lead 50,000 peasants against 500,000 highly trained soldiers of the Ottoman Empire and win, well, with God, all things are possible. But getting back to gallant St. John, soon after the battle, the old soldier of God fell ill, succumbing to bubonic plague, which was at that time surging through the ranks of both armies. After all the glory, he died a humble death, as he would have wished, in the nearby Franciscan convent of Illac in Belgrade, in October of 1456. Many miracles due to his intercession are recorded as following his death. Pope Benedict XIII canonized him in 1724. About 50 years later, a company of Franciscan friars founded a Catholic mission on the west coast of the North American continent, in what we now know as Southern California. Father Junipero Serra named it the Mission of San Juan Capistrano, after our illustrious saint of the day. 
The mission buildings have a varied history of upkeep and have suffered damage from earthquakes over the years, but are now well preserved and open to the public. The chief surviving structures have been in continual use since 1776, coincidentally the birth date of the United States. An extraordinary Catholic pilgrimage, the rich history of the mission has been saved, though the true Mass is no longer offered in the ancient chapel. The vibrations of centuries of holy Masses linger, and as you stroll about the gardens you can imagine the monks pacing under the arched porticos, praying their breveries. If you are ever in California, we can vouch it's worth a visit. But the famed swallows no longer visit. As the song goes, the swallows truly are a part of the history of the mission, but not the ancient history. In fact, there is no mention of the swallows nesting in the eaves of the buildings before the 20th century. Father John O'Sullivan, pastor of the San Juan Capistrano Parish from 1910 to 1930, explains the legend of the swallows in his memoirs. It seems that Father O'Sullivan, walking through the village near the mission one afternoon, passed a shopkeeper knocking down the cone-shaped nests built of mud by the swallows in the eaves of his store. Father said, What on earth are you doing? The shopkeeper complained that the swallows were a nuisance, that they made a mess on his walk, and that he had every right to get rid of them. This, he said, as he ducked and swerved to avoid the swallows who were dive-bombing the home wrecker father, half amused but in sympathy for the birds, writes that he jokingly invited the birds to come with him. Come to the mission, he said. There's room enough for all there. And to his surprise, the birds did come. For decades afterward, they returned to San Juan Capistrano Mission from their winter migration in Goya, Argentina, every year on the Feast of St. Joseph, March 19th. It became a local tradition to anticipate the birds. Special cakes were made, songs were penned, parades were organized. In the early years, the celebration was closely connected to the Feast of St. Joseph, beginning the day with Mass. But by the 1970s, St. Joseph began to be lost in the hoopla, and the number of swallows began to diminish. By the 1990s, swallows were almost never seen around the mission at all, their mud nests no longer tucked in the eaves. Folks said it was because of the urbanization of the area. Perhaps pollution had driven them away, or, or noise. They tried to lure the birds back, so that the miracle of the swallows would continue to draw tourist money to the area. And it seems a couple birds made nests. Someone took a picture of one such nest back in 2018 that you can find on the internet, but it's hard to verify any since. The one thing that has come back, since COVID at any rate, is the parade. But no swallows of note. And you and I know why, don't we? You've been listening to the Catholic Family Podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends and family. You can support the production on Patreon and PayPal, and you can reach Kevin at kevin89davis at gmail.com. At Mayorum de Gloriam. All for the greater glory of God.